Good evening. I'm uh, Joel Woodruff, president of the C.S. Lewis Institute, and it's my pleasure to welcome those of you who are with us in person here tonight at, at McLean Presbyterian Church and those of you who are joining us uh, online through the live stream uh, feed. Uh, it's so nice that we can have people uh, from around uh, the country and around the world uh, join us this evening for the special event with Dr. Daryl Bach uh, titled Cultural Intelligence, Living for God in a Diverse and Pluralistic World. I would like to thank the congregation of McLean Presbyterian Church for allowing us to use their beautiful facility this evening. Uh, they've always been so hospitable, and we appreciate that. And it's so nice to begin uh, in-person events again uh, in this, this, this fall season. Um, for those of you who are in the room uh, here tonight, how many of this is your first C.S. Lewis Institute event? Anyone in the first one? Well, a special welcome to those of you who it's your first event. Uh, and to those of you online, if this is your first event as well, we'd like to welcome you. Uh, to the Institute. Uh, encourage those of you online uh, to click the chat button at the bottom of your screen. And if you do that, it'll bring you to a uh, slide with a number of links and resources that you may like to turn to in the future. And throughout the evening, things may be posted there as, as things are, are spoken about. Uh, as well, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the C.S. Lewis Institute, uh, this ministry has been around for 45 years now. It started in Washington, D.C for the purpose, really, of equipping men and women, uh, ages uh, of all ages, really, to be able to articulate, defend, share, and live their faith in Jesus Christ, both in their personal life and their public life. Uh, our Heart and Mind Discipleship Ministry now has locations in 17 cities in the United States, Canada, Northern Ireland, and uh, it's a blessing to be able to have people from around the world uh, be able to use the resources uh, and uh, tools of the Institute. So again, I encourage you to check out our website, uh, check out our social media feeds, uh, uh, and hopefully you can uh, uh, tune into uh, future events as well that will be coming up in the near future. Uh, tonight, uh, during our event, uh, Daryl Bach will give a presentation, and then following that presentation, we will have a time for Q&A or question and answers. And so those of you who are here in the audience, uh, we have note cards that you can fill out with questions, and then we'll ask that you pass those to the center aisle. We'll collect those. And those of you online, uh, also you can click the Q&A button on your feed online and, and uh, type in any questions that you may have. We'll be monitoring those questions as well. And we'll do our very best to answer as many questions as we can. Sometimes there might be, uh, we can sometimes summarize several questions into one. But we'll do our very best, though, to uh, get those questions to Dr. Bach uh, later in the evening. Please uh, join me now in, in prayer as we begin tonight's uh, event. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the blessing it is to come together uh, in this world, knowing that you are in control, that you are our sovereign God. We thank you, too, that you're at work in the culture. And in the midst of all the chaotic things that are happening around us, we know that you're true, uh, that you're real, that you're authentic, that you're relational, that you love us, and that you've come uh, to give us, uh, show us the way to redeem us and our, our world and our culture. And I pray this evening that you'd bless uh, Dr. Bach, speak through him, and we pray even through our Q&A time uh, that things that should come up and ways that we can talk about things would, would happen in a way that would help each one of us uh, to draw closer to you and to one another and to be more effective in sharing the gospel with others in our culture today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, tonight we'll be addressing this topic of cultural intelligence, uh, which uh, uh, could be de defined as helping followers of Jesus Christ understand the culture that we're in and engage with it in a thoughtful, gracious way, and in such a way that we're able to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ in this world. In past decades, I think we could argue that uh, we perhaps had a little more in common in some ways with the culture that there were some Judeo-Christian threads in the culture. Remember a number of years ago, I went through a training, and, and the way we would greet uh, people or talk with non-Christians, we'd ask this question. If you were to die tonight, uh, and God would ask you, why shall I let you into heaven, what would be your response? Well, that response uh, today might be, well, I don't really necessarily believe in it. There is a heaven and hell. It's kind of a fable uh, idea, and, and question of God's kind of out there. Whereas in the past, the culture might have accepted those constructs. Uh, and another issue we find, I think, today in the culture, uh, very few people really know the Bible. 
Uh, even in our churches today, many people may not know the difference between Adam and Moses. And so we, we're living in a culture today that isn't as familiar with the Bible, where maybe 30, 40 years ago, uh, that was more common. Our world has changed. Now, uh, how many of you uh, have had a situation in which you were talking with uh, someone who is not a Christian, and you had an uncomfortable conversation with them about politics, religion, or something else. Anyone have an uncomfortable conversation? Pastor? Most of us, I think so. Well, the good news I have for you tonight. Tonight, uh, Dr. Box is going to uh, share with us how we can have uncomfortable conversations with others. And maybe, if not, in, I don't know, enjoys the right world, but at least you will, I think, feel that you've been equipped and given some tools to have uncomfortable conversations that hopefully in the long run will point people to Jesus Christ. And so it's a pleasure for me to, uh, this evening to have with us Dr. Daryl Bach. Uh, Daryl is the author, I think, of over 30-some books, uh, has been known, I think, in many circles for helping us think about how to handle some of the culture issues of the past decades. For instance, uh, some of, anyone read The Da Vinci Code in the uh, uh, that book was debunked, fortunately. Dr. Buck did a good job of debunking many of those things of Dan Brown, uh, as well as the historical Jesus controversy that's come out in, in, in past decades. Every, I think uh, it seems like every Easter, Time Magazine comes out again with this question, who is the real Jesus? Well, Daryl's done a lot of work in that area in helping us come to know the real Jesus, as, uh, as shown and, and revealed to us in the Gospels. But Daryl's also been involved in the past number of years, uh, both through a podcast, the Table Podcast, and through Dallas Seminary's uh, Hendrick Center, as he is the executive director of, of enga cultural engagement there, has been thinking and reflecting upon how do we deal with our culture today? How do we talk to people about our faith? Uh, something I think, I guess, Daryl gets to think and sleep and, and drink cultural engagement, think about how do we do that? And I think uh, we're grateful for his uh, thinking on this and reflection, as I know he's going to give us some good thoughts and ways that we can do that today. And so, Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Daryl Bach. Thank you, Daryl, for being with us tonight. Thanks, Joe. Pleasure to be with you. And good evening, y'all. Speak my language to start off with. Uh, I come from Texas. I hope you don't hold that against me. Uh, but it's a real pleasure to be with you. It's a pleasure to be with you online. Uh, we're looking forward to being able to talk about what lies ahead. I have a lot I'm going to cover. So I'm just going to dive right in. I normally do a little comedy thing and jokes at the start, but I'm just going to dive right in. So uh, let me give you an overview of where we're going. I'm going to start off talking about Telstar and the challenge of being bigger and smaller at the same time. So we're going to start. And I'm going to talk about the challenge of pluralism, that we're no longer the home team. Here's my thesis right at the start in regard to the culture war. And that is that we have been misdirected about the mission and have done the church damage in the process. I think we have fought a culture war on the wrong premises and as a result have done as much damage as we have good in pursuing the culture war. So I hope to show biblically why that's the case and where the corrective needs to lie. So um, if you're already nervous, that's okay, okay, because I know... Um, that, that thesis may be a little bit disturbing, but hopefully by the time we're done, you understand why I'm suggesting this. I hope to discuss how to have difficult conversations as the application. So um, Joel's already introduced that theme. And we'll also overview other key elements in developing cultural intelligence. So that's where I'm going to go. So let me start back at the beginning. I like to talk about the Telstar satellite because the Telstar satellite showed up in the summer of 1962 when I was a kid. And um, if I remember correctly, it interrupted my cartoons, about which I was not initially happy. And uh, all of a sudden it came on, and you, the Telstar satellite was part of the communications revolution that we have now inherited in our culture. Uh, those of you who are old enough to remember the Telstar satellite will remember that the way it worked is it allowed for one signal to go from one continent to the other live. And then when that signal was done, they had to shut it down, reboot it, and send the signal back in the other direction. In fact, the first broadcast involved uh, one-way communication in one direction, uh, long TV timeout, and then communication coming back in the other direction. And uh, it used to be online. You could go and see the original broadcast of how this was done. Uh, I think you now have to pay for the privilege of seeing that broadcast. 
uh, as it's gone the way of many things, and, uh, and you watch them describe what they thought was coming. Uh, just to put it in context, before the Telstar satellite, what often would happen is an event would happen in the world, uh, it would be filmed or recorded. Uh, that recording, if it were a video, would require to be developed either at the site or get on a plane with the film and develop it once it landed. And it was a full 24 hours before the event, in many cases, happened in the time you saw it on television. So fast forward. Um, I don't have my phone with me now, which is, I realize it could be a problem. But anyway, uh, because what I was going to say is in holding out my phone, that think about the way our phone works. Not a one directional signal, not one at a time, millions of signals happening in all directions at any time. I can virtually communicate with anyone anywhere in the world whenever I want if they have a cell phone or an equivalent device. What this means is, is that our world is both bigger and smaller at the same time. There are more of us, but we're more tightly connected. And because there are more of us and we're more tightly connected, it means we're more aware of one another than we've ever been. And that awareness is where, in part, where our pluralism comes from. All the options that exist for the different choices, life choices that people have and make are visible to us. I like to compare it to a bazaar. And I say, our, our lives have become like this public bazaar, and you walk through the bazaar and you realize, and some of what's going on in the bazaar is bizarre. And in the midst of thinking about that, it means that there are lots of choices, and in the midst of all the choices, people feel very dislocated. At least potentially so. That's one of the effects of pluralism, are all the choices that come as a result of it. So that's a challenge. Here's another challenge of pluralism, at least in, in the West. Now this has not been true globally, but it certainly has been true in the West, that we have lost our Judeo-Christian net that has wrapped around our culture that was in existence when I first hit the world. And uh, when we think about the loss of that Judeo-Christian net and where that leaves us, we are no longer the home team. We're actually coming out of a section of history which has been very unusual. It's certainly not the way Jesus taught the disciples when he said in the whole second half of his ministry, if you follow me and push back against the world, the world will push back on you. That certainly is what happened, and it's what's happened for centuries. But what happened in certain parts of the West is there was at least a Judeo-Christian veneer that wrapped around the culture that meant that you didn't quite get the pushback that you get in many parts of the world today, and parts of the world have always had that kind of thing, and we're experiencing some of that. So we're no longer the home team. Uh, that's a phrase that comes from Dwayne Lipman, who used to be president at Wheaton College. He wrote a book called No Longer the Home Team to talk about this cultural shift. And my caveat on that is not only are we no longer the home team, we're the visitors, and we're not just the visitors, we're the rivals. We're the visitors who get booed. And so understanding that shift is also an important part of understanding kind of where we sit culturally. Now, for the rest of this, I want to walk through um, six biblical passages that, that lay out a template for how to do cultural engagement, what the Bible has to say about cultural engagement. And I also want to take time to, uh, to develop... Uh, this difficult conversation idea. I'm going to go to six texts that deal with the theology of cultural engagement. And the little slide you see in the corner there says a better way together. I'm going to talk about um, a third way. That graphic, if you can see it in the corner there, has a road going around to the right and a road going around to the left, and then there's a little path up the middle. And Christianity is about a third way that we engage in. And I really think that uh, what part of what I'm talking about tonight is the development of thinking about this third way, what I'm calling a better way together in which to engage. So I'm going to look at six texts to the theology of cultural engagement. And we're going to consider these texts one at a time. 
and then I'm going to dive into difficult conversations. So here is the first text. It comes from Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 18. Okay? But the key verse is verse 12, which is the one that's on the screen. So let me read that initially for you, and then hopefully we'll get a copy of the Bible up here to me so I can get to the text eventually, and we'll go from there. Here it comes. Thank you very much. Flying in. Very good. It's a holy Bible. That's the kind I like. Okay, and uh, let me get to Ephesians, and then we'll read in a second. But here is the key verse. Let me do that one first, and then we'll take a look at the rest of the text. This is I, I'm used to... Uh, to doing this electronically, so I have to actually turn the page. It's an old school Bible, that's great. For our struggle is not, 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 that was emphatic, okay? Against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world rulers of this darkness. And then the passage goes on to say, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Um, the Greek word for the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places is the Greek word cosmocrat, and I love saying this in D.C. If you think a bureaucrat is bad, you should meet a cosmocrat. Okay? So what we're talking about here is a spiritual battle. And what this verse is saying is that people are not the enemy. And if you think about the Great Commission, what you think about for the mission of the church is people are actually the goal. People outside the church are not the enemy. They are actually the goal. Now what I want to do is I want to read the passage in full because there are other things going on in the passage that are important. It says, finally, verse 10, Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And now we get the armor described. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given the gospel of peace, in all circumstances take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, he asked for a specific request for him, and he moves on. Here's the point I want to make by reading that text. It is that our spiritual armor for a spiritual battle is our lived out faith, nothing else. Look at the list. It is the breastplate of righteousness the gospel of peace, the belt of truth, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and prayer. All spiritual resources. And so, the way we engage in our struggle with the culture is not to make people the enemy. People are the goal. But the way we do it is by our lived out faith. It's the most important aspect of what we do in our engagement. Let me ask you to think about this with me for a second. Um, I did not grow up in a Christian home. I came to the Lord in college. I'm not alone. There are many people who've come to the Lord not as a result of growing up in a Christian home, but in growing up uh, came to the Lord through the process of their relationships and that kind of thing. And the point that I want to make here is, is that if you think through the testimonies of people who came to the Lord who did not grow up in a Christian home, it inevitably, almost without exception, has this element somewhere in the testimony. I met a Christian who lived out their faith in such a way that it got my attention. That's wearing the armor of God that we're talking about. 
That's the lived out faith that we are talking about. So this passage, which is the spiritual battle passage in the New Testament, has many things to teach us. I'm not done with what this text has to say. What I want to do is I want to play with the me battle metaphor in the text. And I want to urge you to join the GIA, God's Intelligence Agency. Okay, so I'm going to talk about what that is and what that metaphor looks like. And here's the point. People are not the enemy but the goal, which means how you approach someone who is thinking differently than you is actually very important. And what the culture war has done is it's tended to make people into the enemy. And that's not the way the Bible says we should see them. Here's what I want to say. The battle that we're engaged in is spiritual, and it requires spiritual resources, and then the key point is this. And the enemy in this spiritual battle operates incognito. So here's what God's intelligence agency is all about. It's the idea of, it's a kind of a combination of understanding, you know, cultural intelligence and how it works biblically, but it's also a little bit of special forces. And the idea is, I'm going in to rescue someone who is kidnapped by spiritual forces, only here's the, the catch. The person in danger doesn't even realize they're in danger. They don't even see the danger. They don't sense the danger. They, the devil works incognito, and that's why he's so effective. And so you're going to rescue someone who's in the clutches of someone they've been, in one sense, kidnapped, and you're trying to rescue them, but they didn't even know that they've been kidnapped, and they don't even know they're in danger. My suggestion to you is that when you view the person you're engaged with in a conversation coming from that space, as opposed to someone who's who needs to be crushed, you will engage them differently. And I think that's part of the point of what this text is raising. So the battle metaphor changes. We realize that the battle is spiritual, which means this. That our best defense in cultural engagement is not our circumstances, or our politics, or our ideology. It's our lived out faith. The church has to be the church in order to be effective. Because when our engagement becomes political or too political or too ideological, this gets hard to say in D.C., but when our approach becomes too political or too ideological, we become another special interest group. And if you're just another special interest group, there are lots of choices in the bazaar. We lose what makes us distinctive when we operate that way. Because what's really distinctive about who we are is our faith and the way that faith operates. So, let me go to the second passage. The second passage is 1 Peter chapter 3. This is a well-known text. Most memory verses contain this text, and they talk about the importance of apologetics. This is where, you know, um, on these banners I'm seeing um, conversational apologetics. Our word apologetics comes out of this text. The word apologia in 1 Peter 3.15 is the Greek word for making a defense or giving an explanation for the hope that you have within you. So the passage that everyone knows is this one. But set Christ or honor Christ in your hearts as Lord, uh, Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Actually, the memory verse usually stops before the yet. What I want to do is I want to put this verse in context because I think it has some things to teach us as a result. So here's verse 13. It's up on the slide. For who is going to harm you if you are devoted to what is good? Okay? Straightforward. Okay? Do good and you won't get into trouble. It's what I tell what I told my kids. It's what my kids tell my grandkids. Okay? Do good and you'll be fine. Okay, that's just kind of just basic common sense. 
you would think. Verse 14 tells us, however, we don't live in a normal world. Here's what verse 14 says. But in fact, if you happen to suffer for doing what is right, just think about that phrase for a second. Okay? It is the invocation of what I call box rule. Box rule is every good deed will get punished. Okay? So if you happen to suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Okay? The world isn't a normal place. It is conceivable you will do the right thing and pay for it. That's what that text is saying. In fact, Jesus spent the entire second half of His ministry with the disciples telling them, if you follow Me, the way the world treats Me is the way it's going to treat you. Expect it. It says you're blessed if this happens. And then the next part of the verse is also important. But do not be terrified of them or be shaken. The church is never to interact with the culture around it out of fear. The Bible says, greater is he who is in us, than how does the rest of it go? Than he who is in the world. When we act out of fear, we forget that. When we act out of fear, we end up showing a lack of faith and trust in God. And so when this happens, when we suffer for doing what's right, you're blessed. Don't be terrified of them or be shaken. Fear is not the option or the alternative here. And sometimes when I read this verse, I go, how much of the church's reaction of what is going on around it is motivated out of a fear about what is happening? Now we get our verse. But set Christ apart as Lord in your hearts and always be ready to give an answer who asks about the hope that you possess. Here's the part of the verse that I'm interested in. When Peter has one word that he can use to summarize what our faith is all about. And think about that. If I were to ask you, I want you to pick one word to summarize what Christianity is all about. The question is, what word would you pick? Okay, I can think of a long list. I might think, talk about grace. I might talk about forgiveness. I might talk about salvation. I might talk about deliverance. There are lots of things that could go on that list. The one word that Peter chooses, however, is the word hope. He is talking about where our faith takes us. It takes us to a hope. And this hope is an important idea because what we share when we share the Gospel, what does the word Gospel mean? Good news. The message we're supposed to be taking into the culture is supposed to be a message of good news. Now again, I ask a reflective question. How much of what we hear from the church about what it is that we are doing when we walk with God, how much of that message reflects good news and hope? And how much of it reflects something else? And here's the problem. The Gospel that we share is a Gospel that has built within it a tension. The tension is the tension between the challenge of dealing with sin and the invitation to walk into a new quality of life that God is capable of giving us. And I like to say we are better off teaching and preaching the Gospel starting in Genesis 1 than we are starting in Genesis 3. Here's the point that I'm trying to make. In Genesis 1, we get a description of who God made humanity to be. We are made in the image of God in Genesis 1, 26-28. And we are told to subdue the earth. To basically manage or steward the earth. I don't think we have a developed enough theology of stewardship in the way we think about who we are as human beings. We were made in the image of God, male and female, col to collaborate together as male and female, to manage the garden well in such a way that life flourished and God was honored. And we start there. And the Gospel is actually designed to take us back to that starting point. Granted, Genesis 3 is in the story, but it's not the starting point for the story. If you don't know where the Gospel is taking you and what you were designed to be and where you're supposed to go back to, you've missed a part of the message. 
And part of the good news is the Gospel will, watch what I'm going to do here, will locate you. Remember I said that one of the problems with pluralism is, is that it gives people a sense of dislocation because of all the choices that are out there. But the Gospel locates us in terms of who we are and who we are designed to be. And so it's hope. So my hope would be, about this hope, is that in the tension between the challenge of the Gospel dealing with sin and the invitation of the Gospel into this new life that's lived in a way God designed it to live, that we wouldn't be so focused on the challenge that we never offer the hope. That the good news would be presented as good news because it is good news, but if we never get to the good news, it's hard to see the good news. We're not done. Here's what the rest of the passage says. So let me start again in verse 15. But set Christ apart as Lord in your hearts and always be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks about the hope you possess. Yet do it with courtesy and respect. These are two Greek words. The Greek word prautetos and phobu. Prautetos means meekness. It has the suggestion of humility within it. And phobus is the word fear. The beginning of wisdom is fear of the Lord. Okay, respect for the Lord. That's the idea that we're talking about. So not only is there a message that we're delivering it, but this is important, there's the way we deliver it that also counts. So yet do it with courtesy and respect, keeping a good conscience, so that those who slander your good conduct on Christ, there's it is a second time. Every good deed will get punished. You could well be slandered for your good conduct in Christ. Don't be surprised. The Scripture's telling you it's going to come. Those who slander your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame when they accuse you, for it is better to suffer for doing good. There it is a third time. Three times in the space of a little verse, box law is invoked. Every good deed will get punished. If God wills it, then for doing evil. Okay, so we're talking about hope with a proper tone and with a proper understanding of what the culture is likely to do when we stand up for what it is that we hold dear as a part of that faith. We're not done. Because Christ also suffered once for sins. Why do we do this? We do this, we stand in a place in which we do the right thing and get the wrong reward because it models Christ. Because Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust. That's what He did. And now the curveball. This may be one of the most important features of the passage. It doesn't say the just for the unjust to bring the world to God. It says the just for the unjust to bring you to God. What this is saying is a Christian who shares in cultural engagement is never supposed to forget where they came from. And now I want to picture that for you. What this is saying is is that when my back was turned to God and I was not interested in who He was, He tapped me on the shoulder and got my attention. And I am never supposed to forget that that's where I've come from. And when I engage someone whose back is turned to God and I'm attempting to represent God by tapping them on the shoulder, I am doing nothing but replicating how God reached out to me. All of this is important for the attitude that I engage people in who disagree with me about the way things are in the world. By being put to death in the flesh and by being made alive in the Spirit. So we, we, when we engage in this kind and style and tone of cultural engagement, when we have hope with a proper tone, we actually model and mirror what it is that Jesus Christ did for us. That's the second text. Let's move on to the next one. The next one deals with speech. It comes out of Colossians 4, 5, and 6. And here is the text. Conduct yourself with wisdom towards outsiders, making the most of the opportunities. I find that fascinating, just by itself. 
My engagement with outsiders is described as an opportunity. That's interesting. Keep going. Let your speech always, 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 that was emphatic, be gracious. Season with salt so that you may know how you should answer everyone. Now, always is a technical term. We need to talk about it for a second. Okay? So, always, technical term, that means i got to go to a dictionary. Okay, dictionary is sitting on the shelf. So I walk over to the shelf, I pull the dictionary off the shelf, I start with the letter A, I turn to the letter A-L-W-A-Y-S, I look up the entry, tells me the part of speech, it may even give me an etymology if I'm looking it up in, you know, in the big Oxford English Dictionary, etc. And then I get a definition. Guess what the definition of always is? Now, I can't, you can't do a definition by using the word, okay? Okay, so the definition of always, I mean always works, but it's not always. The definition of always is all the time. All the time. Okay, just to drive it home. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 52 weeks out of the year, 365 days every year, 366 days in a leap year, because you don't get to take a day off every four years, okay? Always means always. Our speech is always to be gracious. So how we communicate to outsiders is as important as what we say to them. That's our third text. Let's go to a fourth one. I know I'm moving quickly, um, but I have got a part two I want to get to. Here we're not dealing with speech. We're also dealing with action. This is Galatians 6.10. It actually comes at the end of a section from Galatians 5 to Galatians 6 that is about the great commandment, actually the second half of the great commandment, that is loving your neighbor as yourself, which is called the royal law of love in the passage. And so we're going through that space uh, from the beginning of chapter 5 to 6, and this is a good evangelical sermon, okay? There's like 44 minutes of exposition and one minute of application, okay? So this is the one verse coming at the end that's giving the application, and it's this. So then, whenever you have an, look at our word, opportunity, so whenever you have an opportunity, let us do good to, another technical term, all people, especially those who belong to the family of faith. Now I want to develop this because I want to deal with something that happens in the way we do and read the Bible that I want to get you to think about. So it says, let us do good to all people. Now all is another one of these technical terms. Okay, we just picked the look at the dictionary, we look up the word always, we put it back on the shelf. So now I gotta walk over, I gotta pull it off the shelf again. Okay, I'm still in the letter A. All these key words are at the beginning of the English alphabet. Okay, and I look up the word all. Okay, part of speech, etymology, and the meaning of all is everyone. Very good. Everyone. No exceptions. In fact, there was a Jewish lawyer who asked Jesus this question. When the idea was said, you're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself, okay? And because he was a lawyer, and I apologize for any legal people in the room, but lawyers sometimes don't know when to stop asking questions. He asked the question, so who is my neighbor? Now, in asking that question, he was doing something that I call, there's the question and there's what's really being asked. Okay? Like when my wife, you know this, you know this moment. This is when my wife says to me, Honey, are you going to the store? Okay? Now, when I get asked that question, I know that is not a question about my proximate geographic location. Well, it is, but that's not the point of the question. Is I want to know where you're going to be in the next 10. The whole point of the question is, Honey, are you going to the store? And I know how this plays out. Right? Because if I answer that question yes, you know what follows. If you're going to the store, can you pick up X, Y, and Z for me? Because if you're going to the store, you can save me a trip to the store. And so I go, yes, honey, and I'm good for 24 hours. 
Okay, that's the way that works. Okay, so there's the question and there's what's really being asked. So when this lawyer asks, so who is my neighbor? He was really probing, are there people I do not need to be concerned about? Are there people who are, who are not my neighbors even though they may be my neighbors? That's really what he's asking. And you know what followed? What followed was the parable of Good Samaritan. Exactly right. Okay? You know, fell among the robbers. Uh, a priest and a Levite did what I call the Indianapolis 500. They saw him and went <clears throat> right around him. That was the priest and the Levite <clears throat> right around him. Samaritan came and stopped and then all the description slows down and a handful of descriptions about what's going on were put forward as he cared for the guy. And Jesus, with that parable, made this point. The question is not, who is my neighbor? The point that he was making is, who showed himself to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the thieves? And basically, the lawyer answers, the, 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 he couldn't say the su, 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 Samaritan. He couldn't even say that. The one who showed mercy. Basically, Jesus told him, go and do likewise. The point of the parable is, the question is not who is my neighbor. The point of you to have is to be a neighbor. And oh, by the way, neighbors come in surprising packages. That's a reinforcement of the idea that the all is the all. Let me deal with another part of this passage, and it's this. That the exhortation is to do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of the faith. So the exhortation is, we treat everyone the same way. Now, it should especially be happening among the family of God. Yes. But here's how you don't interpret this passage. I treat believers one way, and I'm free to treat unbelievers a different way. That text does not allow you to go there. And that's important because there are certain passages where we get in debates about what the scope of this passage is, Matthew 25. Is the scope of Matthew 25 about believers or unbelievers? And we basically take the view of, I can care for a believer this way, but it doesn't matter how I treat everybody else. This text does not allow you to go there with that passage regardless of what you decide about Matthew 25. I happen to think it probably is about other fellow believers, primarily. But I'm also told, biblically, I'm supposed to treat all people the same way. So it doesn't, I don't get off the hook by that answer in terms of what that passage is ethically asking me to do. So this text is talking about how we interact with people, not just in our words, but in our actions. Two texts to go. So then, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. What is old has passed away. Look, what is new has come. And all these things are from God who has reconciled us to Himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. What's interesting here is, is that Paul is in the same place Peter was a while ago. He has one word that he can summarize what our faith is all about. And he chooses the word reconciliation. Reconciliation is where our faith is designed to take us corporately. Hope is what we receive when we believe, but reconciliation is one of the products built into the design of salvation. This talks about a reconciliation from God. The sister passage in Ephesians 2 talks about reconciliation of Jews and Gentiles to one another in Christ because it's a triangle. How I interact with God it impacts how I'm supposed to live with others. Just like the Ten Commandments has two tablets. One dealing with God and one dealing with my relationship with others. Or the ministry of John the Baptist in preparation for the coming of the Christ to prepare a people for the coming of the Lord in Luke 1. says He's going to turn Israel back to God and then He's going to turn the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the just. There's a reconciliation that's working vertically and there's a reconciliation that's working horizontally and the two are connected. Call it the ethical triangle. There's my relationship to God and there's my relationship to others. So this is a ministry of reconciliation. In other words, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to Himself, not counting people's trespasses against them. Key verse that I'm interested in in this passage is the next one, 
starting in verse 20. And He has given us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. We are citizens of heaven, and the most important relationship we have is that citizenship, and that citizenship in heaven is transnational. It involves many tribes and many nations, people from a variety of backgrounds. And I would love to have time, I don't have time to do it, to develop the way ambassadors function when they're in a country. And the way they don't isolate themselves from the people they are ambassadors on behalf of the nation for, etc. There's an engagement element to that. I don't have time to develop it. As though God was making His plea through us, notice the tone in this verse. As though God were making His plea through us, we plead with you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That's our message to the world. And look at the tone of it. Remember I said earlier, there's challenge and there's invitation? This is the invitation part. We're inviting people into sacred space, and here's why. And this is why politics fails. Because what people need more than anything else in this world is a heart change. The Old Testament is the experiment. If God is present and God's laws are present, what will the society be like? We did that with Israel. And guess what happened? It was a failure. It was a mess. That's why we got the New Covenant. The New Covenant came along to change people's hearts from within. I like to use the example of Ephesus as the counterexample here in, in the book of Acts. When did the magic books go away in Ephesus? It wasn't by a law that the city council passed. It was by changed hearts. One other point about the early church. The early church had no spiritual, had no cultural power, no social power, no political power. All it had was spiritual power, the power of its lived out faith. And how did the early church do in that environment? Very well. We may need to think about what it means to go back to the future. Last text. This is the one that summarizes all the others. This text almost never shows up in a discussion on cultural engagement. It's the one that I'm treating as the capstone text. It's in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 22 to 26. But keep away from youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faithfulness, love, and peace in company with others who call upon the Lord from a pure heart. You may not recognize it, but that's actually the armor of God put in an exhortation. It's our lived out faith. But reject foolish and ignorant controversies because you know they breed infighting. And the Lord's slave must not engage in heated disputes, but be kind toward, oh no, all. Our technical term, making a cameo appearance. Be kind toward all. An apt teacher, patient, correcting opponents with, oh no, gentleness. Okay, we're putting together some of the passages that we've seen. Perhaps God will grant them repentance and then knowledge of the truth and they will come to their senses and then look at this. Escape the devil's trap where they are held captive to do His will. And we've come all the way back to Ephesians 6 and the spiritual battle and the fact that the devil works incognito in the culture. God's job is verse 25b and 26. Our job is to be faithful in how we live and how we share the message. I want to stay in my pay grade when I engage. Okay, I am really tight for time, so I'm going to move real fast. Okay, so just bear with me. Let's talk about how we talk. I want to apply this. I want to note that all important conversations involve triphonics. All important conversations have three levels attached to them. There is what I am talking about. That's actually the frosting on the cake. 
There is how I read what I'm talking about. Those are the lenses that I use. Talk about lenses, all I have to do is say CNN and Fox. They look at the same reality, but you wonder if they're living on the same planet. Okay? And then there's the way my identity is wrapped up in the conversation. All significant conversations operate at three, three levels simultaneously, and the drivers are what's going on underneath. Not the topic that I'm talking about. In fact, sometimes the topic that I'm talking about is but a symptom of what's happening at these other two layers. That's really important to understand. Let me tell you how I learned about this. I've been given a gift. The gift that I've been given is the ability to multitask. At least I think I have that ability. Which means that I am very good in front of a computer screen. I can pay attention to what's going on in a computer screen and follow a conversation at the same time. Okay? This gift annoys my wife. Okay? It just does. It annoys her immensely. So she'll talk to me and she'll say, you're not listening, at which point I have a choice. I can defend myself by repeating, and I'm capable of doing this, by repeating the words that she has said to me. Okay? No, I was listening. This is what you said to me. And just pair it back what she said. Okay? Um, when I respond that way, guess what her response is? I'll use a German phrase. Nicked fro means she's not happy. Okay? This doesn't get me anywhere, just to advise you. Okay? Because what she is dealing with, and this is the point of a difficult conversation, is not what we're talking about, or even what she's sharing with me, although that's important to her. What she's really talking about is her identity. She is saying that what's on that screen is more important than you're taking the undivided attention of listening to me, and you're saying something about how you view me in the process. She's right. So, all conversations operate at the level of triphonics, and we're often dealing with both the combination of what we're talking about, the lenses that we're using, and we talk worldviews and that kind of thing, we're in that space, but what we tend not to talk enough about is the way in which identity is wrapped up in that conversation and the values that people have as they are wrapped up in those conversations. Here is my point. We have to do a better job of listening when we're going to engage in cultural intelligence. We actually have to get to know where the person is coming from and why. And we're looking for not just the things that we can criticize, we're looking for the things that motivate them to think the way that they do. And hopefully, perhaps to connect to some things that they raise, values that we may actually share, but that their application of it is different than our own. That takes good listening. You can tell really quick whether you're a good listener or not by whether when someone says something to you, you're formulating your rebuttal, this is going to be my response, or you ask more questions of them to ask and try and seek to understand where they're coming from. One of the most important things I'm going to say to you tonight is coming next. There is a difference between making the effort to understand someone and the appraisal with which you handle that conversation. And it is a very, very important to distinguish those two things. And my first goal in any difficult conversation should be to pursue the understanding of where the other person is coming from before I move or before we move into a joint appraisal. It's very, very important. It's hard to do. It takes discipline. But it's important. So what kind of a listener are you? Are you a butter debater or are you a listener? It's a good question. Now I'm going to talk real quickly about the five things that sabotage conversations. I apologize for dumping so much information on you. I am a fire hydrant at the moment. Okay, but just hang with me. Here are the five things we do that sabotage any conversation. I will tell you that the examples of virtually every one of these can be spotted on national TV on a daily basis. The first is what I call the quick confession and pivot. Here's how the quick confession and pivot goes. Someone raises something where your position or your view comes up short in one way or another, where you're responsible for some element of dysfunction that's going on, 
And there are really two ways to deal with it. One is to quickly confess, yeah, that's the case, and then as soon as you can get through that confession, add a but on the other end. And then try and pivot. Actually, in the public relations world, I was taught this when I engaged in the public square. This is called the pivot. Okay, someone asks a question that you don't really want to answer because it's uncomfortable for what it is that you're representing. Okay, you want to pivot to what you want to talk about as fast as you can. So you acknowledge it with a quick confession and then you pivot it as soon as you can. This is what this does at the identity level in a conversation. You have just disrespected the person who's brought up the point that you're raising. They're concerned about what it is that they've raised and you're concerned about changing the subject. It's an act of disrespect for the point that's being made. That's the first one. Second one is what I call demonization. I sometimes label it the exorcism. And this is an equal opportunity employer because all sides in our polarized world use it. It's the basis being most of our commercials that we show on TV when it comes to politics. Here's how it works. Okay, you will, As soon as I do this, you'll get it. Conservative, liberal, Marxist, fundamentalist. Okay? It is engagement by label. Engagement by label is a way of avoiding a substantive conversation. You label the person and then you do this. You play taps over them. End of discussion. Sabotage is a conversation. Second category. Third, mode of assignment. I'm going to tell you why you're telling me what you're telling me, and usually the motive is negative. Sabotage is a conversation. Challenge of the identity, disrespectful. Fourth, never surrender the attitude. Never give any ground, because any movement towards someone is defection from your position. And the last one is just raw tribalism. I have to defend my cause at all costs. It makes you do things you would never do normally. And I think we've seen this in our culture in the last decade in a couple of ways. Those are the things we do to sabotage conversations. What about things that help conversations? Okay, this will be surprising. Be vulnerable. I call this owning your own junk, owning your own stuff. It means when someone points out something that is the contribution of your side to the problem, you acknowledge it. You don't move on. You own it. Second, you stick to the issues. You don't engage in personal attacks, which means you're slow to demonize and do some of the other things on the other end. You're humble about where you are. Now, this fourth one's important. I am not saying in anything that I've said you give up your convictions. You're honest about your convictions. You set forth what you believe and why. But you do it with the right tone. Almost all relationships that we deal with deal with two levels. There's the level of ideas, and then there's the way in which the relationship impacts those ideas. Conservatives tend to be very focused on the ideas that they have. And they tend not to think so much about the relational level of what they're doing. But your idea never absolves you of the relational level of how you're interacting in the space. Illustration. A parent walks into your office as a pastor and says, my child just came out as saying they're gay. What do I do? Now, I may have a view about that, theologically but it doesn't absolve me of the pastoral and relational responsibility I have for all the relationships that are triggered and all the discussions that will take place in that space as a result of a child feeling that's where they are. You have to have both levels. And in fact, you can have the right ideas with the wrong relational strategy, the tone being wrong, if you will, and you will still be wrong. La lastly, learn how to parse the issues. Learn how to recognize the layers in the issues. Learn how to recognize the judgments in the issues. 
have a table that I like to use when this happens, and it goes, um, A, I'm so certain of this, I'd argue with God about it. See my friend Peter. B, I know there's a disagreement. I'm pretty sure I'm right, but that's where I am. C, if we get to heaven and you turn out to be right, I won't be surprised. D, let's flip a coin and be honest, neither of us knows. That's a spectrum that we're dealing with. And most issues that we have that have layers have those judgments attached to them, and the spectrum is kind of all over the place depending on the layer that you're at. Having some awareness of what, that, what those parsings are and how that sorts itself out tells you how tenaciously to hang, hang on to the things that you have convictions about. It's an important layer in, inter, in engagement. Now, there are three types of issues in the world. There are raw worldview clashes where the differences are so stark, there's very little common ground. I think we have two issues like that in our culture right now. One of them is abortion. The other is the discussion on same-sex marriage. Okay? Second, shared goal but different paths. Reconciliation of the races is in this category. If I go out on the street and ask the question, should the races be reconciled? The answer above the board would be yes, absolutely. If I ask a second question, which is how do we do that, that's where the disagreement comes in. But at least we are agreed on what the goal is in the conversation. Okay, That's a better place to be than category one. However, most of our political issues that we operate in today are where solid values are in conflict. And here's the important point. Because we live in a dysfunctional world. And so values collide. They don't work functionally. They work dysfunctionally. And what happens in our politics is each party picks the value that it wants to lock in on and ignores the other conflicting value, and we never have the discussion in the space that we need to have, which is how do we balance these two values, each of which has merit. My premise is, is that most of our political discussion in most of the issues that we face is in this third category and not in the first category. And when we fail to recognize that, we elevate issues to an importance they do not possess, ultimately. I'm almost done. And I'm sorry for running long. Here are the principles. Learn to recognize we all make judgments about what to prioritize, and in many cases, core identity issues drive the judgments that motivate our choices. That's describing a dynamic. I'm not saying whether that's right or wrong. I'm just saying that's what happens. Listening helps us see what is driving someone else and makes for a better conversation. I say one of the most important things to do in sharing with people is to get a spiritual GPS reading on them. Where are they coming from and why? My grandmother-in-law grew up in a Christian home in a Baptist church. This is back in the 1920s and 30s in which her father beat up her mother. Guess what her thought about Christianity and religion was as she grew up? It's important for me to know that if I'm going to talk to her about Christianity. The only way I find that out is to get to know her. All of these principles with regard to listening build respect and trust. So here's what I am saying, thinking through the early church and Paul, and I'm wrapping up now. We need to distinguish between the way Paul talks about culture in Romans 1 from the way he talks to culture in Acts 17. In Acts 17, he says, begins his speech on Mars Hill by saying, I can see you are spiritual in every respect. He says, I see you're interested in spiritual things, so am I, let's talk. Now he does go on to challenge the way they see that space. But he opens with a move towards them of respect as he engages them. The early church, back to the future, I've already talked about this, no social, cultural, political power, but spiritual power. They did pretty well. Maybe there's some things we can less learn from them. Here is my bottom line. The church needs to spend probably a little more, a little less time talking and a little more time showing. I like to put this in the tune from Hamilton. It goes like this. Talk less, show more. Our lived out faith is the armor. There are two ways to read Scripture. From Bible to life, that's how we teach our leaders how to read Scripture. Start with the Scripture and apply it to life. 
Okay, the other way to read Scripture is a life situation and take that back to the Bible. And this raises the dilemma of how we teach the Bible versus how people read the Bible. Because my premise is we teach the Bible by going from the Bible to life, but most people read their Bible by taking a life situation and asking what the Bible has to say about it. It's not the same kind of reading. Both readings count. We have to be able to switch hit. We need to teach our leaders how to do both. The different kind of reading from life to the Bible is scenario-based. Here's the life situation I find myself in with the dysfunctions that it has in it because we live in a fallen world. And it requires a knowledge of the canon. It requires not proof texting, but looking at a series of texts. And my example would be, if I read Romans 13, I might think I never have anything to say about the, gov about the government or the way I'm being ruled. But then I've got to deal with, what do I do with all those books in the Old Testament that are critical of the government? Finally, cultural intelligence requires six points. It requires understanding the mission correctly. People are the goal and tone matters. It requires more listening. It requires a different way to see people the way we disagree with. We don't need to crush them. We need to understand the spiritual forces that are at work and the incognito spiritual forces that are at work in dealing with them. It requires learning to understand where people are coming from and looking for common ground connections, but engaging them in the pursuit of a fresh application. When I find that connection that I might have with them, I might say, is that the only way to think about it? Maybe there's something else we can do. It requires working, I didn't say this during the main message, but I'll say it now, it requires working to put a rock in the shoe of folks. I get this from Greg Kunkel, and uh, the point is, a rock in the shoe is, is giving them, saying something that gives them pause about where they're coming from. You know, a rock in the shoe is very irritating. You get it in the shoe, you want to shake it around, you want to get it to the point of the arch. Hopefully your arch is big enough that you can put it in that space and not deal with it. Eventually you get so frustrated you take off the shoe and get the rock out of the shoe. So this is engaging with someone in such a way that you give them pause about something that they are thinking or doing. It isn't trying to win an argument. It's just trying to get them to think about where they are. It's an important difference. Understanding the value of a lived out faith where we talk less and show more so that they'll ask, you seem to respond to things differently than I do. How does that work? It requires understanding the gospel is central, which means we cannot make the world into the church and we should not try. But contend for what makes a flourishing life, recognizing we are not trying to win a debate but gain a soul. That's that relational level. While also understanding we may have to learn how to lose well in the world. Last, all this can be done because we have nothing to fear and we know victory comes one day. A secure identity in Christ means we can engage resting in our heavenly citizenship as paramount and decisive for trusting in faith and resting in God. With that, I'm done. I apologize for running so long because it's not going to allow much time for question and answers. But that is the way and the route, I think, and the principles involved in a theology of cultural intelligence and cultural engagement. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Joe. I really appreciate the wonderful, <laughs> giving us a lot to think about. Uh, we're going to move into a, a Q&A time now. Uh, so Darren and I will be up here on stage. Uh, those of you who have questions here in the audience, we'll be passing those to the center and note cards. And uh, those of you who are in our live stream audience, feel free to text in the questions uh, in the Q&A uh, part of that. And we will uh, uh, be able to feed those here uh, to Daryl as, as they bring in, bring them in. So uh, we're going to move now to our Q&A time. And I already have a few things for you here. So okay. <laughs> yeah, first of all, Daryl, thank you. I mean, we really covered... A lot of ground, but really gave us some wonderful things to think about. And I think uh, it's so relevant, the world we're living in right now. We're, I think most of us uh, feel like we're in this very conflictual world. Uh, one thing that struck me, you mentioned, uh, first of all, the idea of, uh, we all look through, through a lens. I think you see CNN and Fox is kind of the, you know, you have these yeah. two, two ways of looking at a problem. What would you say are, are some forums that we can engage people in? Now, here in D.C., you have the... People who are in political forums, they may be in Congress or they're 
on CNN and Fox <laughs> doing these, those kind of forms. But how do we kind of, I'll say, everyday normal people, what are the forms that we can have and use to engage people uh, who may be uh, different and have different views than we do? I, I think that um, I'm, I'm going to go back to the ideas and the relational mm -hmm. model that I'm talking about, which I think is the core template. Yeah. Because there's not only how there's not only what we engage them on the topic and the way we try and approach that and the way we kind of raise questions about that or the way we might challenge where someone is thinking or think about hey have you thought about it this way that kind of thing, but there also is the way I relationally connect to them in the way that I'm having that conversation. Mm -hmm. Here's a very important principle: people will not care about your critique unless they know you care. So, if I know that the gospel has an element in it that challenges people, I'm going to want to engage them in such a way that my ability and awareness of my caring for them is also evident. One of the things that I think is very fascinating about Jesus when you study him is the way in which people on the margins who were criticized in the culture all around them sensed they could come to him which means they understood he cared. Mm -hmm. so, so that's a very important... And then the other thing that I like to say about Jesus that we don't think about enough is, who is Jesus the most critical with? Mm -hmm. Everyone knows the answer to that question. <laughs> it's our vaunted friends, the Pharisees. <laughs> yeah. Why was he most critical and harshest towards them? Because they claimed to represent God but didn't. And so, so my point here is, when I think about the, the forum and the way we approach conversations in the, in the various public square spots that we may occupy, how I relate to people, how I care for them, the way in which I can surprise them mm -hmm. by the way I interact with them and care for them, will raise that question that I talked about earlier. You seem to operate differently than what I'm used to and what I might expect. And I don't mean that in an acquiescing kind of way. I mean that in a way, in a caring and engagement and respectful kind of way that will throw them off mm -hmm. in terms of what they expect. Mm -hmm. So for example, uh, I meet a colleague at work, we're having a discussion, and um, somehow politics comes up, or, and they basically, well, the people believe that are racists. So how do you, how do you deal with the label makers? You know, and, and how do we apply some of these principles to, in a sense, diffuse uh, that, that piece of it? Well, uh, usually what I, what I will do is I will ask some more questions because I will probe what people mean by their terms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what do you mean by racist? Because one of the problems that we have in the discussion of race is that people mean different things by the term racist. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that, here's the other trick. I may hear something different than the person intends by the use of the term. So let's take races for the example. I've actually had this discussion on multiple occasions. Okay, I live in the South. Okay, so I'm sensitive to the term racist. Okay, I have like these, I have these antibodies that appear when the term racist appears. And what I hear when someone accuses me of being racist, at least initially what I heard almost by default was, you just accused me of wearing a white sheet and being a club signing member of the Ku Klux Klan. That isn't who I am at all. That's my reaction. Sometimes, however, the way the term is being used is that racist means someone who fails to recognize the differentiations in the society around us mm -hmm. and, ha and either doesn't care or is not engaged about those in such a way that their passivity allows it to continue and for someone to be disadvantaged by it. Mm -hmm. That's a different definition of racist. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. The only way I know how that term is being used is to ask some questions, mm -hmm. okay? And if I can get to that level, I still may have to parse out that discussion, you know, to sort through it, but I'm in a different space than the person, than I think the person who's just accused me of being a member of the Ku Klux Klan. Mm -hmm. So this is why the listening part in the, and asking questions out of the listening is so important mm -hmm. because it can clear up misunderstandings in the conversation and when you have misunderstandings in a conversation, you actually talk past one another. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I suppose a part of it is uh, not looking to be offended. Uh, all the time. I mean, since, and if you're, you're instead uh, giving the person the benefit of the doubt, you're uh, listening, you're 
asking them questions. You, you get beyond your own personal, I, you already know who your identity is in Christ. So you don't have to be offended. You can listen. Is that that? Would that be yes, and I think it's very, very important to actually engage the person by understanding where they are coming from as, as precisely as you can get your hands around. That's why I call it getting a spiritual GPS reading on someone. I want to know what's motivating, what drives them, why they have that concern. I'm going to actually share an aspect of their concern. Okay, so I want to probe that, figure out what that is, and then build the conversation on something I can hang the conversation around that might bring us towards one another, as opposed to looking for the things, at least initially, that I disagree with. And the way sometimes I might do that is finding a value that we share, but that we apply differently. Where I can say, you know what, I share that concern, but this is how, this is how I deal with it. Let's talk. And I suppose you, you mentioned, uh, it's interesting, the, the gospel being uh, described by Peter's hope and Paul's reconciliation. Yeah. And I think th those two uh, words would fit quite well in, in any conversation. There's a third word that's important in this conversation. We're thinking about the New Testament. It's the word power. Mm -hmm. And the word power does not mean power in terms of rank, the way we tend to use it. It's in Romans 1.16. Mm -hmm. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and to the Greek. And, the, and I, for years I read it this way, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the salvation of God. To the, I didn't know what the word power was doing in the verse. Mm -hmm. Then one day I thought to myself, let me read Romans as a story rather than as an epistle. Mm -hmm. Here's the story. When we start off, we're dead in their trespasses and sins. Mm -hmm. And the first question to ask is, how much power does a dead person have? Mm -hmm. None. Wow. We're justified. When we're justified, that God gives us His Spirit. He gives us a power. He gives us an enablement because we walk into new life. Okay, When we walk into new life, that's chapters 6 to 8. The Romans doesn't stop at Romans 4 and 5. 6 and 8 means we're able to walk in the ways of God because we now have the power. We now have the capability uh, to walk in God's ways. What Paul is saying is what jazzes me about the Gospel is the new life that comes with the Gospel. Which means that if we only talk about the cross and forgiveness of sins, mm -hmm. we've left out part of the Gospel story. And now I'm going to have fun. Okay. Okay? I'm gonna, I want, you got to think with me as a Baptist. Okay? You can't think as someone who sprinkles. we got to think of the full picture of baptism here. Okay, So get that weak stuff out of here. All right. So we're going to think immersion for a second. Think about the picture in Romans 6. When you're lowered down in the water because of the, what Christ has done on the cross, you are forgiven for your sin. Okay, but if you don't talk about new life, this is what happens. You go into the water and you stay there. The picture of baptism is I'm dead to sin, but there's a second half to it. I'm raised to new life. That's the power. That's the capability. That's actually the delivering part of the good news. The reason my sins are forgiven is so I can be washed clean and get that new life. Okay? So when we only emphasize forgiveness of sins and the death on the cross, we never connect the Gospel to the Genesis 1 space. I'm made in the image of God and now I'm being empowered to live the way I was designed. And that's what has Paul excited about the Gospel. Hmm. And that, that, that's a great way of looking at it. I think it gives you great hope, too, just as a, if, if we as an individuals know that we're now living in this new life and this power, it gives us uh, a, a lot more reason to, to engage the world. We don't have to uh, be afraid, as you mentioned. Exactly yeah. right. Well, let me look at some of these uh, questions we're getting in here. We're getting a good number of them. I'll try and be quick. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so do you have tips for engaging people with subjective view of reality? <laughs> <laughs> um, we need to meet ourselves. Mm -hmm. We're all, we all have an element of the subjective view of reality. We're all formed and formulated by the experiences that are around us and by the way we, we see it. So the, and so the question becomes, what is forming and what is shaping my identity? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how do I process what those forces are and how to, how to do it? It makes, you know, it makes all the difference in the world. I'll be real concrete makes all the difference in the world if I grow up in a stable two-parent family. Mm -hmm. I grow up in a home in which my parents fought. They separated. I ended up being taken in by social services and raised by people who weren't even my family, etc. Okay? 
And that helps to form how you see the world and the way you interact. Some of that is subjective, okay? But that experience shapes people. Mm -hmm. You can't deny it. Mm -hmm. So you've got to help people cope with the backgrounds that they come out of, with the stories that they have, et cetera. There is a deep pastoral dimension to everything that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. no, that's good. That's good. So uh, how does a faithful theology of engagement account for engagement uh, with uh, false teachers within the church? So how do we deal with that issue? Um, we deal with all ideas. We try and deal with all ideals the same way, which is to attempt to show, I think, from a biblical point of view as a Christian, um, what the biblical perspective, or at least what the best biblical options may be in dealing with the space. And, you know, false teaching is teaching that misdirects in one way or another. Um, you know, um, the sin in some texts is described as a crooked path. It's not the straight path, it's the crooked path. And so you're just, you're, you're trying to do the best you can to make the case for why you think this is what the Bible teaches versus something else that someone else is teaching. It's hard to do because false teaching does exist. I mean, the first century was dealing with false teaching as well. Um, and not all handling of false teaching went successfully. So here's another principle, another bullet point. The challenge for any individual believer is a commitment to try and be faithful. And then the next question becomes, faithful to what? Do I get to define what that faithfulness is? Or am I faithful to uh, what, what evangelicals have believed is I'm, I'm faithful to the way God has revealed the way I should walk and live? That's what I'm trying to do. I'm not held responsible for the results of someone else. They suffer the consequences for their decisions, pro or con. Okay? but I am responsible for the way I faithfully walk with my God. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you, that's good. I th this question, I think, fits well within some of your basic premises, that the idea that you first said that people are the goal, not the enemy. Yes. Uh, but we do have an enemy. And right. so how do, how do we avoid uh, making people the enemy? And, and uh, are there some things we can do to, <laughs> to avoid that trap? Um. We apply the things that we were talking about. You respect them. You listen. You engage. You engage respectfully. You may end up challenging them, but you do it. Um, you do it in a way at, until they show signs that they're not at all interested or whatever. And then, then the issue is to make them aware of, okay, you've made choices. You will be responsible for those choices one day. I actually love the fact that God is the judge and I'm not. Okay, because I can put I can put the onus on where it belongs, which is the accountability that they have before the Creator. Mm -hmm. That's good. I, I think what, to follow up on this is that it does seem it's very easy uh, when you begin watching well, various uh, political shows, you hear things on the radio, and even in, in churches, you, you begin hearing things about the other side, and uh, it's easy to get spun up. Are there some things that you think we should avoid that might, uh, I, I guess, spin us up to where we, we, we lose sight of these principles? When you start seeing the things that sabotage conversations being in play, ignore them. When you see the use of labels, which is actually designed to keep you from moving into a conversation with someone and moving towards them, okay, you want to ignore the label. You don't want to ignore the issue but you want to ignore the label. Recognize that what labels are designed to do is to actually short circuit the conversation about the issue, and they do not help you as a result. Mm -hmm. And how, how can we then get into substantive conversations uh, w with people? I suppose, I guess maybe this might be the question. Uh, Jesus does talk about sometimes there's the ripe fruit and the fruit that's not quite so rare. There are people who are maybe ripe for the harvest. Uh, does that apply in just even the conversations about truth. Are there some people that 
you know, we just have to admit, okay, we're not going to be able to have a conversation I, with others that we yeah, do. Yeah, I, I mean, some of them end up being operating at the level of worldview clash. And so a person who doesn't think that there's such a thing as truth or something to be engaged with, that's a worldview issue. That And that's something, but then you want to ask them, so why are you so obstinate? Obstinate, I'll use that word. Why are you so obstinate about people who don't agree with you if there's no such thing as truth? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't each of us get to define? Uh, if you take the view that each of us gets to define our truth, then why are you on my back? Okay? I mean, so sometimes, sometimes the most effective way of engaging is to not defend your premises, but challenge the premises of the other person and show how they operate inconsistently. Okay, that that becomes a rock and a potential rock and a shoe mm -hmm. moment. Yeah, oh, that's good. That's good. All right, let's see here. How do you approach this statement? That Christian faith is biased because it rejects other religions. Basically, the exclusivity uh, question. Mm -hmm. The answer is um, some charges I will accept. Okay, yeah, it's biased, and and the bias is the uh, the bias comes with the assumption that all religions are equal, okay? The challenge of Christianity is the claim that all religions are not equal. So from a world's point of view, it appears to be biased. And I'll say, yeah, there's a bias, but the question is you got to... <laughs> I like to say the angels is in the details, okay? So you got to think through what, what that conversation should be like. If there is a creator and he's made us in a certain way, to be a certain kind of person with a certain kind of belief. And he's offering, I mean, think about it. What God is offering to people is a way to restoration that does not depend on them. And I turn that down. And then, this is, I'm, I, the only time I'm going to quote C.S. Lewis, okay? <laughs> you get what you pay for. If you say that it's on your back, God honors that choice. You made a decision. I offered you I offered you life, and I offered it on terms that said you don't have to provide for your own life. I will provide for it. You said no thank you. Mm -hmm. And so God says, yep, no thank you. Very good. Um, this is a, a, I guess a good DC question. Uh, how, how should Christians engage in politics? I mean, how, how, uh, they should be very careful to be self-critical about their own allegiances. Um, which means a willingness to recognize when their party or tribe is wrong. One of the most important things about the Bible in the Old Testament is, is that the people of God were called to be self-critical. When we cease to be self-critical, we're in a dangerous place. So that means that I'm going to want to listen to critique for the possibility that there may, it may not be totally true, but there may be some truth in it that I need to pay attention to. That's part of what I'm talking about. And you're going to want to be very clear as a Christian. If we're going to talk about a third way, then it's developing the ability to say, on this issue, this group may be right, but on that issue, that other group may be right, and to be able to go back and forth. Mm -hmm. So uh, following a, just a, a straight party line and, and, and a platform that doesn't, doesn't always work too well for the, for the believer. To the extent that we are not uh, uh, um, omniscient, okay, which me and, we're, and we also are sinful, the chances are that any platform that's ever been written probably has a problem in it somewhere. That's good. Uh, let's see. Uh, another one tucked away in here. Let's see here. Um, so uh, this one has to do with, with fear. How do we conquer fear? We, we, we've talked about the fact that we shouldn't go, be afraid, we shouldn't go into the fear, but uh, to be honest, we all get fearful of conversations, we get fearful of dealing with people. Uh, what are some ways that we can uh, enter into these conversations uh, and, and conquer the fear? Um, to levels of response. One is to try and recognize what's generating the fear. Try and come to understand why we're fearful. That's one element of it. 
And the second is probably a lesson from history, which is think about all the fearful situations in which God's people have resided in over time. And God has still been with them. Um, sometimes through easy times and sometimes through hard times. In the end, you're going to have to trust where God has you. Um, and the comfort or, or lack of comfort that those spots are in. The Americans have a rare ability um, to not want to be uncomfortable. And uh, actually, I don't think it's that rare ability. I think that's pretty human. And, uh, and, and yet at the same time, God told, Jesus told the disciples, if you follow me, you will be in uncomfortable spaces. So we've got to understand that suffering is part of discipleship. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. It's a it's a hard uh, uh, but very real truth, and Jesus obviously makes it and pretty clear. And some global Christians in other parts of the world understand this far better than we do. They do definitely. Well, just a last uh, question here. There's a statement that it, uh, uh, sometimes you can win the battle but lose the war. How, how does that does that apply to this to this what we've been talking about tonight? And if so, how? That's why um, I think it's important to think through is the way in which we've conducted our cultural war the most biblical way to go about the battle. And I think, I think the point is a misdirected mission ends up creating a lot of shrapnel. Um, and people, people are now coming to the point where they don't identify our faith with our faith but our faith with our politics. That is not a good place to be. Yeah, for sure. I think this brings us right back just to your, some of your opening comments, just the power of a, uh, a life that's lived according to Jesus' gospel and, and the, the power of the armor of God. And uh, it's a wonderful place to... Our lived out faith is the armor and nothing else is. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, uh, Daryl, just for this uh, wonderful uh, presentation discussion this evening. I, I know you've given us all a lot of thought about to think about and I think really apply. And I, and I think our prayer is that we can all begin to apply these principles and concepts in, in our daily interactions, uh, both in a uh, personal but also public uh, in a public way. So thank you so You're much. You're very welcome. And I apologize for running along and no, uh, trying to do so much. No, it's wonderful. We appreciate it. It's, it's, I know it's, people have a lot to reflect about. And uh, those of you uh, who um, uh, have the opportunity, I encourage you to go to our website again. Uh, into, uh, uh, in, the, in the chat room. I think w probably Daryl's book should be populated there. It's called Cultural Intelligence. Uh, uh, and it's a, it covers many things we've looked at tonight. So I encourage you to pick up the book. Uh, personally, I think it'd be a great study for small group, for, uh, for Christian schools, for churches, for you name it. Uh, we all need to really work in this area. And so thank you for giving us a wonderful tool uh, to, work, uh, to work through in the future. So, uh, again, thank you to everyone here uh, in the room for being with us, and as well, everyone who's uh, on our live stream broadcast. We're so grateful to have you with us tonight. Uh, the CSO Institute is a not-for-profit ministry, and we rely upon the giving of generous people like yourselves. So I encourage you to prayerfully consider making a gift to the CSO Institute uh, so we can do further events like this in the future. And as well, I encourage you to uh, again, check out the resources of the Institute and pass the word out about uh, this event and, and others to come. God bless you and thank you for uh, being with us tonight. Mm -hmm.